Okay, great. So um, that was great. So I'm going to switch gears from, from the networking space a little bit here and talk about um, what I titled watching the superpowers. So I want to spend a second just to talk about like where this talk came from. So the call for um, papers or, or call for abstracts was out in August and we were working on the, there was a lot of patches flying around about the signature um, signing BPF programs. And so this talk is really about um, what I was trying to do is, is understand how sort of the BPF programs that I maintain can could possibly work um, in this space. And so um, I actually had a couple titles that I that I came up with when I was working on this. And the, the, the first one was the BPF signing broke my tooling um, because I couldn't see how some of my tools were going to continue to work in this signing uh, model where you sign the BPF object program. And I'll, I'll describe um, for people that aren't you know following the mailing list what, what that actually looks like. Um, but that seemed a bit like I was just pointing out problems and not giving anybody uh, sort of any hints on, on a possible solution. So, so I scratched that one. And then I went um, I went with the title two here, which was an argument for BPF runtime policy, which was, uh, I'll hint at, hints at sort of the proposal is, is you know, an alternative to uh, BPF signing is sort of deep audit control over what sort of programs are loading and, and how they're interacting with your system. So not simply relying on a signature um, at load time. And then, then finally, it was, it was just kind of fun is to talk about the, it's bees all the way down. Um, this idea that we have BPF monitoring BPF um, and they kind of, where do you stop? You know, where, you know, do you need another BPF program to monitor the monitor of the BPF programs and so on? Um, but uh, I settled on watching for the superpowers. So, so that's where we're, that's where we're at here. Um, See if I can find there we go. And then, so for agenda, um, I want to cover the kind of high level. It's going to be a, a pretty high level sketch. Uh, the details of how to actually sign BPF programs is, is pretty involved. Um, I'll give you some links, uh, but try to give enough detail there to just uh, get people off the ground if they're not following the mailing list. Um, then I want to set up our examples. Uh, we'll use kind of a simple example here, but I think it reflects kind of the use cases. Uh, that we're that we're going after, and, and even though they're a little bit trivial, I think it captures uh, the interesting aspects of signing. And then, um, as part of those use cases, I can show kind of where I believe the tooling is going to break as you go through the signing exercise. And then, sort of propose an alternative and discuss, uh, you know, the pros and cons, what we lose from the alternative proposal, but what we also gain from it. Okay, because I think there's no silver bullet here that's going to solve all. Uh, all your problems. Um, and then finally, we'll just wrap it up. So if you don't, I don't know uh, me, I'm looking at the list, I know most of the people here, but uh, a lot of people, a few names I don't know, recognize. So I've, I've been a kernel developer for quite a while. I've um, been working on BPF a lot lately. Um, kind of also become a BPF user as part of one of the Cilium uh, kind of core developers on Cilium project. And I am currently at Valent where I work on Cilium uh, and a lot of the other open source stuff. So that's kind of my background and where I my, where I come at this from. So I thought it was useful um, just to briefly discuss kind of what is the difference between kernel modules and BPF programs. So on the left, I kind of have the idea of what a kernel module is in my head. And then on the right, I talk a little bit about what BPF programs are. So this is pretty high level, but I, I think it's kind of interesting to level set on what, what the differences are between these things, because in, in my mind, they're not the same. So on the kernel side, you have modules and the safety depends on the diligence of the developers, right? So you're, you're, you might have tooling and static checkers and all the good stuff that we have and a lot of the, um, um, testing infrastructure that we've built up. So there's a lot to help the developer there, but at the end of the day, you're dependent on the developer um, kind of doing good practices, right? And then it's usually built and distributed. Uh, you, you know, you get your object files and you can power your distribution or from your vendor or, and so on. Uh, they're usually kernel version specific, so they're built against the kernel headers or a stable API in the kernel. Um, and the expectation, I think, from many users is that they're they're stable APIs, right? You don't you don't change your Netlink API from day to day. Your Netlink API isn't vendor specific. It's not like Cilium has a Netlink API that's different than anyone else's Netlink API. So they're very stable over. And the lifetime of modules is quite large. Like, I mean, you're thinking years, right? Vendor distributions are offering contracts for five or 10 or more years. 
Um, if we contrast that to BPF, right, where the safety is built into the loading process, right? So when you load your BPF program, your expectation is that these programs can't do sort of things front into the kernel that you don't want them to. They must terminate. They're not going to access out of bounds memory and so on and so forth, right? And they're often, um, at least in my experience, they, some of the more interesting use cases are often dynamic, right? So we have, I'll, talk, I'll have to show some examples later, but the idea being that I don't always know ahead of time what BPF programs um, I want to run. And I have, there's a lot of tooling existing out there that will try to dynamically patch the programs or even just dynamically generate them um, based on either user input or some scripting language and so on. Um, kind of what enables some of that is this core idea. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, the basic idea is if I want to read a struct field in a structure, uh, that field might be moving around from kernel version to kernel version. And you want a single BPF program to run from you know 419 all the way up to latest, for example. Um, and in order to do that, we have core. The idea is that there's a BTF description of the kernel and core lets the loader um, push the right offset into the structure. So you can always find your PID inside the task structure, regardless of your kernel, um, by using this BTF data directly. Okay, and then I think the last time that which distinguishes it between BPF programs and kernel modules is the lifetime is completely different, at least in, in my mind, in some sense here. So like you might have a BPF trace program that you use once and throw it away, right? Maybe I want to debug something on my, on my live systems. Uh, for example, we recently had an IPsec uh, problem. Uh, we create an IPsec debug program, distribute it, run it. Once the bug is found, uh, throw that program out or put it in some repository in case we need it later, right? But that is not a long living program. On the other hand, some things do have long lives like Cilium, a lot of the Cilium programs have been around for years. Okay, so this is sort of like a high level, um, no surprises I hope for most folks uh, here. So then I wanna give a brief sketch. Uh, I apologize, this is a super, super quick sketch um, about the BPF, how BPF program signing has been proposed. Um, and you know, if you want all the details, the links at the bottom there, um, I recommend reading it. The, the cover letter is, does a pretty good job of describing how all this works. But I want to at least give some of the difficulties in what signing, um, what signing these programs uh, entails for folks that you know, aren't following this closely. So as I mentioned, so core um, is going to rewrite the program. So at low time. So if you sign a BPF program up front and distribute it, um, that's not going to work because that signature is going to be um, different after the core happens, right? You don't know what these offsets are going to be, so you're doing relocations, changing the code, and it's not going to work. Um, that signature isn't going to match anymore. So the same thing for FD, we have different um, file descriptors in there. You might um, change those. Uh, we want the signature to continue to work. Right? You don't want um, to hard code your signature to a very specific kernel um, in a very specific layout. Okay. And then the other thing that makes this kind of difficult in my mind is that loading BPF programs is, is kind of a multi step process. It's not just um, you know, a single program that gets loaded, it has various maps, um, a kind of a whole set of syscalls that go into actually loading this thing up. And that's kind of the, what libbpf is doing or what the Go, um, Go BPF loaders are doing as well. Okay. And so the what we want actually is the signature verification to capture this entire process right we don't want to have per kernel signatures for bpf programs we want to sign a bpf program and have it load and match the signature across um, across various kernels so this has mostly i think been implemented um, i think there's a few few more things about how to get the signature and verify it but this idea of kind of having a stable bpf program that runs across um, that'll work across multiple kernels and could be signed is, is mostly uh, already pushed into the kernel. Uh, the link is there at the bottom, um, go and read it. But the, the sort of sketch here is that you build a loader program that kind of encapsulates all this information. You down pass that down to the kernel and the kernel can replay that over, the, uh, over, those, um, over that loader program and you sign the actual loader program so that way it doesn't change um, over time. Okay. So, um, that's kind of a high level sketch. So now I want to get down into the um, kind of what we get from signing programs. What's the advantage? Why would we want to do this at all? And for that, we'll start to talk about um, 
Alice and Eve or Bob here. So the kind of case that I'm looking at here is that Alice and Bob are our two signed BPF programs. So on the left is Alice and on the right is Bob over here. And then we have this malicious Eve who, um, who wants to eavesdrop on the kernel or maybe Alice's maps, for example, right? So if Alice.o um, is signed and Bob.o is signed um, and then Eve.o doesn't have a key, um, then trying to load Eve.o there is going to get rejected by the signature checking in the kernel, right? And this is what we want. So that's a, um, a good win for signature checking, right? And then I just note here is if, as long as you get your file system um, correct, if Eve as an application is trying to read other maps in the system, um, then you shouldn't have access to those maps based on permissions in the file system. So you've sort of isolated Eve here. Eve, Eve can't, um, can't inject programs. And Alice and Bob are, are happy and running correctly because their programs are signed. Okay, so that's sort of the, the immediate win um, from signing. And then what I want to talk about next would be the what I'm calling imposter Alice. So we, we captured the obvious case with some arbitrary application trying to load a program that's not signed. Okay. The next one is this imposter Alice. And so what I'm what I'm saying here is that you know something application or daemon or something in your system, it looks like Alice, it behaves like Alice, except for it tries to load a program that's not Alice's dot O. And you know, again, um, because of signing, when Alice tries to load that corrupted Alice.o file, it will be rejected because the signature won't match. Okay, so this is good. This is what we want. Um, but there's a kind of a, a small kind of hitch to this whole process here uh, that I want to call out here. So if Alice is not um, kind of a corrupted or malicious program, um, but is instead generating dynamic BPF programs, imagine like an XDP filter or a TCP filter, um, a runtime generated network program or something, you know, like your BCC tracing hooks, how can a signed, those don't look signed from the kernel side, right? Because the programs are changing. It's not clear uh, to me how signing can solve this case. And so what happens is that Alice with the dynamic um, program generation looks like the uh, Alice that's been corrupted, okay? And so the signature uh, is then going to reject Alice.o, even though there's nothing particularly wrong with Alice, maybe we want to run BCC tracing hooks um, for debugging or otherwise, um, but we just can't do it here in the signature model because there's no way to sign Alice.o unless you give Alice the keys, of course, uh, but we don't really want the keys sitting on the system. Um, and so this highlights the cost of signing, uh, is how I'm referring to this, right? So you get these good properties where Eve can't load and corrupted Alice can't load. But what you're doing is you're saying that dynamic code generation, dynamic automation, optimizations um, are not going to be distinguishable between uh, a malicious Alice and a, what I'm calling a good Alice or your dynamic program generation, right? So this is the cost. So we get the, we get the goodness, but we also lose this dynamic um, programmability. And then what I wanted to say is that like, it's not like you're, um, this is some hypothetical case that doesn't exist. There's lots of reasons you might want to write dynamic programs. And there's lots of tooling um, out there today that actually does that will break when this happens, right? So this is why I started thinking about the problem is, for example, BPF trace is a high level language. You can generate the, the BPF program from the scripting language, for example, right? Um, P4 is another one I've worked on in the past. You define a, a DSL with your networking, and then you'll generate your BPF programs and distribute those as sort of networking blocks, right? And so you can optimize your networking stack for exactly what your networking uh, requirements are. Um, Cilio, uh, which I work on, also does some optimizations with the BPF layer. So um, you'll have a, a pod specific BPF program that's optimized for that pod. Um, this allows you to do things like skip Mac checks and IP checks and various other things and just optimize for the features that are enabled on that specific pod, right? And um, also in sort of the, inside the Cilium um, kind of umbrella of, of tooling, there's a PCAP recorder, which has an egg 
TCP basis, right? So it's not clear um, how these would easily work inside the signing framework, um, because if you sign the program, well, the program then can't modify the DPI, okay? So um, again, we get some goodness and that we can't load this corrupted program, but we've broken at least these tools. Okay. Uh, so that was kind of the first, the first title, right? BPS signing broke my tooling. And so now we'll kind of go on to the second part here, which is how do I go about to fixing this, right? Um, so what I want to achieve is I want to block the malicious actors, Eve, uh, um, in this case, from loading manipulating programs. And I also want to block um, sort of Alice that I don't expect to be generating optimized code, but I want to allow um, the code generation. And so the next slides here, I'm gonna go over kind of a proposal for that and kind of what we gain and what we lose. So first example, uh, the one we already covered, we wanna ensure Eve cannot load the programs or read or write to, to maps. So that'll be our first example that we'll, we'll show with the proposal. Um, the second example, which uh, we didn't talk about before, but we want to ensure um, that if we do have a corrupted Alice, that it can't, um, that it stays contained, right? So we talked about if a, um, if a program tries to read a map from user space, uh, we can have file systems protected. Um, but then there's a question about what happens if the program is a BPF program, how does we protect um, the maps and so on from that side? Um, and also it was really interesting to look at this from a, uh, the perspective of least privilege when you're talking about maps. It might be perfectly fine for Alice to read a map that's been published by Bob, but uh, we don't want Alice to say right to that map. Um, and that can be either because Alice is malicious or perhaps it's just BPF tool and somebody mistyped a key and they delete your, you know, your firewall. You want to make sure that sort of permission wise that that's not allowed, but you still want the observability piece from the debugging. You want to be able to read those maps, et cetera. So we want to get that um, supported. Um, and then the last piece, which we talked about um, is this dynamic code generation. And we want to make sure that Alice um, still works even when Alice is dynamically generated, but we want to try to minimize the impact that we are causing here, right? We want to make sure that um, we have some ways to ensure that Alice is a valid program that should be running and should be generating these um, uh, these programs. Okay, so those are the, the three examples we'll try to solve. And then let's talk about the tooling that we have to do this. So, um, uh, so I used a handful here, um, FS Verity, which is a read-only file-based authentication protection. Um, it's in the kernel, you can read about it. I got the link, um, the basic, premise, I'll show kind of on the next slide on how that works. Um, I assume you could also use IMA for this, the integrity measurement architecture. I didn't do that in this, um, in these examples. Um, but uh, my understanding from reading the documentation is that would be an alternative to FS Verity. Um, and then of course we have the BPF Cilium and our superpower BPF. Okay. All right, so what is that severity? In case you don't know, um, the, uh, there's a couple of kernel fields you enable, so you can enable config verity, um, and then you have this user space component, and you mark your file system with support for it, and then you can start signing your files in user space, and then any reads or corrupted, any reads of corrupted data will fail. So if you, if you do something like DD um, over the top of it with some random data, um, then the next time you try to open it, it's going to fail. Um, they, they'll open. Okay. It also has key ring support. I didn't poke too much into that uh, yet, but then uh, that idea is instead of verifying the signature, just reading the signature, like as an audit support, you could put those signatures inside the key ring in the kernel and, and use that, which would be um, in many ways more secure. Right? And so on the right here, it's just sort of a, a dummy example is you have your Alice, you corrupt Alice, and then Alice won't launch, which is what we want. Okay. So what is that? Um, so what does that look like from the BPF side is, is how do we read these out of um, these hash values out of the file system, right? So the first way is we could do it from user space with IOCTL. Um, we don't really want to do that because of the talk tower issues, right? You, you, um, if you launch something 
you read its uh, its hash um, from user space based on some event like we exec Alice. Uh, you could, in a theory, stop Alice with a kill all or something, but um, you know Alice may have already loaded the program or or gained um, kind of access to whatever secrets it, it was trying to get. So we'll just kind of cross that off and just machine it for completeness. Um, what's interesting is that it's quite trivial to access it directly. Um, there's this SMP load acquire um, from the inode to the iVerify info, uh, which has a memory barrier. So um, in my examples here, I sort of skipped the memory barrier, but there's work to do with memory barriers. And I think it's included. I have to double check what kernel version. Um, it was actually added, but for a production version, you'd want to make sure you have the correct memory barriers there. Um, but inside that structure, you have your root hash and your file digest hash, and the file digest hash is the one we're interested in here, uh, which is a hash specific for that file. So the um, the workflow then is when you exec a, um, Alice, you can get the inode, and from the inode, you can get the hash, and then you can decide if that's a valid hash or not, and what, about, what that means to decide if it's a valid hash. Um, and then finally, there's a question that I had a few open questions and talk about at the end, is, is whether there should be a helper. Um, if we need a helper to actually instantiate the hash rather than have user space do it, um, and what the kind of right uh, control plane would be for such, such a thing. Um, but before we do that, um, I just want to show that this solves kind of some of our solutions um, to our examples. So the first one um, that the signature solving solved and, and probably the easiest one is that you, you have this uh, malicious Eve who's trying to eavesdrop on the kernel. They try to load their program with Eve.0 and the signature um, failed at the load time, right? But um, without, if we, for example, didn't have signature loading, could we still stop this with um, kind of a file verification approach? And the answer here is yes, we can. Um, so instead of stopping at the SysBP upload time, um, uh, we did a, kind of a different process that we verify Alice and Bob at open that they're allowed to um, they're allowed to load BPF programs. And then when Eve launches, we say, well, this hash is not, is not supported in my list of supported hashes that can load BPF programs. And so we, uh, when Alice tries to load, we go, that's a, um, Alice task struct has been annotated with the correct, um, the correct annotation to allow it to load BPF programs, whereas Eve has not. So we'll just um, stop the loading of this BPF load. Okay, and uh, we wrote a little, tool for this, um, and the tool I called watch BPF, it's just a cobbled together set of scripts, um, but I think it illustrates um, kind of what a flow would look like uh, when you do this. Um, and we have a small configuration file, which we um, put the allowed hashes in, um, in this case. Uh, and we'll talk about you know, how to do this better uh, at the end, I think, uh, if people are interested. So the first thing we see, as I mentioned, is you see process Eve startup. We attach to that task struct um, after looking at the hash, we attach this BPF denied attribute, which is just part of the, the metadata now that flows around with this task struct. Um, and then when Eve tries to load a program, we return um, denied. And so we don't allow it to, um, to load. Um, I added a few kernel patches to make this actually work, but you could do it with LSM, I believe. I'm still kind of flushing out the details um, to make that happen, but I added a new action that would let it return a, an EPERM error directly from kprobes. So um, that's there um, and then does what we want. And then we see this Alice uh, process, it gets launched. And then what's interesting about this is because it's just a BPF, policy and it's implemented in your own policy BPF um, program, you can just do kind of all sorts of interesting things that aren't just allow and deny. And so we added a, a probe approve and a maps denied. Um, this is perhaps a bit silly, but it, it sort of illustrates this ability to add uh, kind of fine grained policy. And what this, this means in our kind of mock program here is that Alice is allowed to load BPF programs, but Alice is not allowed to do use maps. Okay. Um, again, maybe a bit silly, but you could imagine 
uh, more fine grain, like read only maps are allowed or um, is not allowed to update certain maps and so on. Um, and then what happens here is when the sysbpf call is made to load the program, we get the task struct, we go back and we get the attributes that we associated with it from, um, from the exec. And we say, okay, we have the right bit set here. We can approve the loading of this program. And this allows Alice to load the program. Um, and then you can do other things at the bottom here. It was just, um, I was continuing to play a few games um, with this sort of policy engine. You can say, you know, if the user space application Eve ever tried to update a map by calling a syscall of sysbpf update, we could just deny it because it doesn't have privileges to use sysbpf update call. Right? Um, and you can get this when you look at a sysbpf um, call, you can pull this out of the bpf attribute strats just using your, your normal kind of core um, core syntax for that. Okay, so um, I think what we've shown is that for this this first case with the very obvious malicious program Eve trying to eavesdrop on the system, it's pretty trivial to block the load without even using um, BPF signatures at all. Right, you base your attributes based on the the application that's trying to load the program and its very specific uh, hash that it has from. Um, either your, your FS Verity or IMA or, or sort of any of the other hashing schemes that you can think of, as long as you can get at it from the BPF side and not use FS Verity because it was inside the uh, inode struct uh, and quite easy to pull out. Um, and then we also showed uh, that you know you can do things like read only map policies or read write map policy. And here we just have a, a blanket deny policy, but we could um, quite easily do even more fine grained policies. You know, we are only allowed to update, only allowed to read, uh, only allowed to update certain types of maps and so on, right? Maybe, um, you know, never allow Alice to manipulate the tail call maps, for example, um, because we know that that's uh, a way to um, get programs to be skipped and so on. So those were the two, I think, easier cases. And, and I hope I've showed that they're not uh, Signature uh, checking on the BPF object isn't really required to, to kind of catch those cases. But there's this third case that we talked about where Alice is um, is corrupted at runtime. So in this in this case, what happens from the from kind of my watch BPF uh, demo here is that you um, Alice gets launched. Um, the signature checks out at launch time, but as something kind of after that, Alice is corrupted, right? And once that happens, now the question is, that metadata that's associated with the task struct hasn't changed. When Alice loads that program, what is gonna happen is Alice is going to get approved to load the program, okay? So this is both bad. So it means that, that if Alice is dynamically generating correct programs, everything is good, Alice can load their programs. But on the other hand, if Alice is generating malicious programs because the program has been corrupted from some other kind of malicious user, now we have an issue where what previously would have been caught by signing is, is no longer caught, right? So we've got the good. Um, we can now do dynamic programs um, with some confidence uh, that what we started with when we launched Alice was good. Um, uh, but we've kind of removed the ability to detect this kind of runtime corruption case for Alice. So, what are some things that we might consider doing? Um, oh, sorry, I, I skipped a, skipped a slide and I mentioned it there was that we talked about, um, you know, what's the thought experiment? What can, um, what could Alice do even if we had signing is kind of the point of this, um, this slide. And what I wanted to, to point out um, that, and, and just to ensure uh, that folks aren't putting too much, um, you know, putting too much kind of uh, emphasis on the signing is that BPF signing is going to ensure that your BPF program is correct, but it says nothing about your user space side, right? And as a thought experiment, what can your user space side actually do? Um, if you have like a Cilium, like a networking application there, or, um, you know, a load balancer or whatever, there's, there's kind of lots of things user space could do to break that application besides, you know, even if the sign program was loaded, you know, they delete the firewall, redirect all the traffic out of different ports, eavesdrop traffic, et cetera. So the, the uh, same way with observability programs or security applications um, that are using LSM and stuff, 
um, maybe move attach points around um, or modify tail call links to sort of change up the program. So the, the point I just wanted to be here is to be careful that you don't um, decide that because your programs are signed, your programs will do the correct thing that they were signed to do. Um, all we're saying is that the program that's loaded um, in the BPF logic containing that program um, has been signed, but that doesn't mean the logic from the user space side is going to do um, the correct thing, right? So, so just to be to be clear that um, you know, even though you have the signed program, you can still get very negative effects, right? Uh, perhaps not as bad as if the PPF program was you know directly manipulated, but still, if this is critical infrastructure, this is your load balancer, um, you're still um, in a whole lot of trouble with the firewalls deleted. Okay. Um, and so as an alternative to signing, or, or maybe as a complement, depending on, on where you stand on signing your BPF programs, so what could we do for these um, to detect runtime corruption versus dynamically, um, dynamically generated programs? And so I have a few ideas. These are just proposals. They're not something that I implemented in that sort of sample program that was that was dumping this fields and adding to, um, approving or denying the launching of programs. They're just they're just thoughts. Um, you know, the basic high level thought here is that if we had enough information about the program being loaded, can we create policies that are good enough to allow dynamic um, dynamically generated programs? safely in these environments that really want to kind of clamp down on what their programs are doing or sort of alternatively if it's an auditing environment you can say well well that's quite odd that my alice program for example has you know for the last six months been running without a right user call at all and then all of, all of a sudden starts to write user data right that might be something that your your audit team should go and investigate for example right and so what, what kind of signatures are interesting from a BPF side? Um, we have calls, so you might be interested in any types of helper calls or what the, the CFG is of the program. Um, if a program that was a networking program wasn't reading kernel memory and starts to do a bunch of probe reads, that might be an interesting indicator of the type of program that was generated. Uh, map reads, map writes, we could do enforcement on to ensure that you know your BPF tool program doesn't get locked out by or your BPF trace program doesn't get locked out by signing, it's still allowed to load, but perhaps we don't ever allow it to, for example, write to maps. Um, you know, it's just a debugging program. It's not, it shouldn't be allowed to write to any of these fields. Um, you know, and that, that might have just operator value, for example, right? You, do, you don't want um, to be debugging a system and then accidentally delete a, a map entry. Um, and so there's kind of all of these things that we could consider um, including and there's really how do we how would we get them um the thought that i that um that came to mind uh recently is that we we have these attributes now um in lvm that were recently added that can be passed down um it seems like one possible avenue to do this type of um bpf program um, behavior modeling and policy would be to include um from lvm side a list of all the Sort of helper calls it uses, all the map operations, um, so on and so forth. Figure out the right set of attributes you want to associate with that. That's valuable from a from a BPF policy side, and then have the verifier ensure that only those helper calls are used. For example, right, and and then the the BPF program you're having could read a kind of a bitmap of BPF calls. Um, your verifier is going to ensure that that kind of type definition of the BPF program is, is honored. Um, and this would give you the kind of ability to ensure certain calls are used or insert, you know, update is never used or delete is never used, for example. And so um, I think what the, the sort of summary here, um, oh, sorry, uh, uh, sorry, I jumped ahead again. I'll give you one, one more open question list. Um, but what I was gonna say is I think the summary of, of sort of this idea here is that we want to make sure our dynamic programs keep working. Um, and in order to do that, it doesn't appear that signing is a correct solution for that. So we at least need to sort of um, either only do signing when we know the programs are not gonna change, but allow unsigned programs if they meet sort of policy guidelines. Um, 
is, is the proposal here versus if you don't have that flexibility, you're going to get into a case where your, your BPF trace tooling doesn't work, your debugging tooling doesn't work just because that is all, all dynamically um, generated code. Uh, then if we went this route, the, the next question I have is some open questions. You know, what does verify uh, mean and what does authorize mean? Um, and what I mean by that is, in my sort of example program here, what I did when I verified them is I just looked them up on a, um, looked up the hashes in a map and was like, those hashes map, match, um, so we should be good to load this program. This is sort of perhaps not as secure, for example, as having key rings. Uh, but in order to get into the key ring, we need to think about, you know, how does a BPF program have the ability to read the key ring in a way that's, that's secure? Um, and then the next question is like, how do we know that we should authorize it? Um, you know, if do we need to have read-only maps? If we, um, uh, you know, like how do we secure that authorization policy from being modified by again the same tooling you're trying to allow? You know, uh, from BPF tool side or BPF trace side. Um, so, kind of, what are the next steps um, for this thought experiment on my side? I've been thinking about, you know, what does the control plane look like? How do we use the key ring? Uh, instead of having the file system kind of pre-configured, how do we trigger these measurements from, from the file system's BPF side, right? You, you open the program, maybe it's not signed, well, we should sign, uh, generate a trigger to do the sign, right? And we have this on the IMA, IMA side as well already. There's an IMA hash, but it's only usable from LSM. Um, so the question is, is there just kind of more flexibility that could be to be gained there. Um, these are all things that I've, I've kind of been thinking about this as I did this work. Um, so in summary, um, I think hopefully I've hammered it home enough already, but um, you know, BPF program signing appears to be incompatible with much of the useful BPF tooling, your BPF traces, your debugging, this, these kind of really interesting use cases. Um, Application signing covers many of the obvious cases, right? Like if, if the application is allowed to load programs, you get two or three of those examples covered, right? Um, the next point I just wanted to make and reiterate was like, even if your BPF programs are signed, corrupt application can still break your critical infrastructure. And um, finally, um, I think improving visibility in the BPF program launch allows this ability to audit and dynamically build these policies. Um, for these dynamic programs as an alternative uh, to BPF program signing. Okay, and with that, I will stop. So thank you and take any questions. Thank you, John. There's one in the chat, if you can take a look at that. Oh, okay. Um, let's see, for the user land changes within our maps and program logic, for now we're detecting a security BPF, BPF map. Get back to D all with the probe for the maps we're currently manipulating and tainting the execution saying it was pro compromised. Um, yeah, so I think that's the kind of thing that we're um, we've been looking at doing those types of those types of operations. And I think what we're just proposing here is maybe even more fine grained is useful, right? Not just map get FD, but maybe map get FD should mark the task as read only because um, I don't want I don't want my debugging tools to ever write to my firewall maps that are managed. So thanks. John, thank you for your talk. I think uh, to me, it sounds really nice. I could see that we would use this for the DDoS protection that we have, which is also like a code generator. So we can rely on that very much. Um, I think it would be nice. So like one comment why I think it would be nice. Um, for us, I think the, the infrastructure to signing would be provided by another team. And I've spoken to somebody a while ago, um, and I think the idea would be that we kind of authorize binaries that have been built by our CI infrastructure, which we kind of trust. Right. And then um, we could just take this, you know, we want to do this for other binaries, like our Nginxes, et cetera. We could take that and apply that same, same idea if it works. We could apply that to BPF. So I think that's really nice. Um, I have a couple of questions, and one of them is how would this work with dynamic libraries? I guess that's kind of the obvious uh, problem. And then the other one is how, or maybe maybe this is kind of depends on implementation, I'm not sure. Uh, 
um, how would you kind of attach signatures or distribute signatures in in this model? Right. Yeah. Um, so I think the dynamic library one is is perhaps easier. Um, so if if you have a dynamic library that's also signed by IMA or, or Atmospherity, then presumably if that library has ever been manipulated or corrupted or, or just as the wrong library, for example, right, then the signature shouldn't match um, on the open of the library. So there's two ways you, I think that that could work. Either you could just rely on the, the normal file system signature checking to fail to load because it doesn't match. Um, or you could just, you know, use the kind of the BPF side on, on open. So when you open the shared library, put a capro hook, read it. If it doesn't match the signature, you know, do whatever, right? Do, you know, maybe it's just the wrong version of the library and it's not terrible, or maybe, maybe for some reason that library has been corrupted or it's, you know, what well, there's, you know, hundreds of reasons on why that might happen, right? Um, so I think that, I think that can be solved kind of that way. Um, I haven't actually gone through the exercise of trying it. So like there's still that, you know, the, the theory to, to practice to see how, you know, what, what happens. Um, and then um, the other question was about attaching something. I'm sorry, I lost the last question. Like how will we distribute these signatures? Is it something that's oh, kind of right. baked into the ELF or we ship it as an extra yeah. file or is there too late? Yeah, so that that was the open question I had as well. Um, so right now, for the for the, the kind of uh, you know little scripts and things, right? I just encoded it into the Elf, right? And then they're just there. We check them. Um, that's probably uh, not going to work for your CI example, for example, right? You don't want your your tooling to somehow encode the the correct hashes back into the Elf and then rebuild it. It just I don't see how that could possibly scale, right? um yeah i think it's a it's a good question I'm, I'm not sure um exactly how that should work and I, I think it's a good kind of next steps to understand um one thing i would look at is like how do the, the existing file systems manage the signatures for the key rings and um uh, you know i'm coming at it from the for the bpf kind of networking side um as someone who has all these tooling that that is auto-generated um Hopefully, like we can find somebody from the keyring side who understands how that keyring side is distributed, kind of above the kernel. Um, maybe leverage some of that, but it's just a, you know, a, a work in progress. Cool. Any any other questions? <laughs> Hi, John. So this is Alex. Uh, nice presentation. Thank you so much for putting together all the slides on and the thoughts. I really like the idea. Uh, I think it has a lot of potential. And beyond from what you mentioned of uh, providing a more secure uh, signature, some more flexible, I think it will uh, resolve all of our ongoing um fight with unprivileged bpf as well because of the all the spectrum meltdown and all the exploits that coins well, they're not really exploiting bpf but they're <clears throat> finding new ways of uh doing speculative execution in the cpu so with if we have this more flexible uh bpf based way of doing the writing the policies through the as a BPF program while using a festivity mechanism for actually for the signatures of the binaries, including like shared libraries and all the collateral, as you said, uh, that should work. I think it should solve all of these uh, issues with the unprivileged, including this signature verification of dynamically generated programs like BPF trace. So, and it sounds to me is that the biggest here is and probably actually have like as you said there is am i may hash access from bpf site already there are the same hook in the right places like this uh uh prm exec so like all the shared libraries like at this point the programs would 
LSM probably, uh, we just need to have an access to fast variety metadata to check for the validity of the binaries and share it and et cetera. And it should all just work. I think like it seems to me that to make this dream achieved, it's more of the tooling work, more of the user space work, more of the this watch BPF making it like production ready than changing the kernel. Yeah, I, I mean, I agree. It's like I was, you know, I didn't put a ton of time into this watch BPF, right? Like this was just uh, like a proof of concept that, you know, was done in a couple of days. So it's not, there's definitely a lot of work to go from that to something production, but as a, as a BPF infrastructure side, it's, I think it's mostly there, right? You need maybe a couple helpers. I, I just grabbed it, you know, landed in there as quick hacks and, and that, that was about it. So. Yeah, I think it's yeah, absolutely. The access to FS variety is like really nice and it will <clears throat> probably go beyond just uh, signed BPF programs, but to the rest, right? So. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. There's also some root signing stuff too that you know is, is sort of outside of my my knowledge, but could I could imagine also being useful. But that's sort of a, uh, I think a to do or somebody who's really familiar with how all the keyring stuff works would could could maybe say something about that. I also like the idea of uh, adding. Uh, I think in one of the slides you mentioned to have another hook like LSM like hook after the verification when verifier already like collected all the data about the yeah. programs, like what helpers it used, like everything, everything. In this case, we don't even yeah. need realistically LLVM annotations, just the hook after yeah. verification all completed and all the data is gathered. It would be nice, like in some cases, we can use that as part of the lifting some of the limits, for example, like this 1 billion instruction limit, that could be part of this decision making, like whether a particular user is allowed to use only 4,000 instruction, another user are allowed to use a million or a billion. Right. Would be interesting right. whether certain kinds of loops are allowed, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, even just a bitmap of the calls, right? The helper calls. Some like, like we recently disabled the uh, user write, for example, right? Yep. Um, yep. And in a lot of like maybe ninety nine percent of the cases, that's the right decision. But there's maybe one case out there that you that you want that to be okay. And, and having a bitmap is something the verifier should be able to do trivially. I mean, just collect yep. them as it's going. And if you have policy, then it's sort of on you to decide what you know what you think is valid. So. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it will allow like any kind of because after verification, we'll see what kind of maps it's using or helpers. We can allow or deny any combinations. In in a I I, I carped on the, the read only one a little bit just because like I, I deleted something from a, a map with my debug the other day, right? On accident. And I just I was on the wrong node, right? But if that node was sort of had something like this, maybe BPF tool wouldn't be, you know, is allowed to read, but not write these maps because I really don't want to accidentally delete something from my firewall, you know, so even, even simple things like that. <laughs>